Hello, Fearless Gamers, and welcome to another podcast here on Fearless Games. I'm Matt the Vet, and today I am joined by... James Wildcard. How's it going? Not bad, not bad. How's it going? Pretty good. Um, Good deal on eBay after our whole discussion on deals on eBay. <laughs> I got good. a brand new inbox plastic elder autoc for only 10 bucks there you go deal achieved yeah deal achieved <laughs> um so some interesting things have been happening over this uh, last weekend with the 40k weekender yes but i think mm. the coolest thing and i hope it's not gone forever was some tau terrain from gw yes um, I actually have been meaning to write them to ask if that t- terrain will be coming back. I think it would be, quite frankly, stupid on their part if it was just while supplies last, because that sold out so quick. Yeah. Because people were like, OMG, non-imperial terrain, basically. Yeah, and it <laughs> floats. It moves. Yeah, no, it's, it's just... It's, sold out, availability no longer available. It was just really cool to see non-imperial terrain like it's not like it's evil imperial with spikes on it or orc applied it's a straight up tau and that was cool uh out of everything they did which um fire warriors getting an update also awesome but the terrain that was the coolest thing for me 40k related that i've seen in in you know actually probably in a couple of weeks to be honest because yeah Cool, new kits and refresh kits are cool, but it's not often that they tackle non-imperial terrain. Yeah, and we need more non-imperial terrain, mainly because not every battle in the 40k universe is the Imperium getting attacked. <laughs> it's true, and not every battle is two alien forces fighting over the carcass of an imperial city. Um, yeah, but you know... It's one of those weird things that 40k, technically the setting is the Imperium, because yes. they kind of took it over for the most part. But you have that sector of space, which is Tau only. And yeah. you do have you know cases where it doesn't. It would just be refreshing to not have it be Imperial only. Like, in general, also, like, a good example, Eldar. The Imperium attack craft worlds quite often. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it'd be nice to have some, or Maiden planets, you know, where they're excavating ruins of an Eldar city or a Necron tomb world. Something. Yeah, no, I mean, it was cool. It was a few years ago when we got that uh, battle board piece that was a Necron piece from Forge World. Yes, we got the tomb world. Which was cool. That was another step in a good direction. But this, the Tidewall Rampart, to me, looks like probably, I'm hoping next week or the week after, they're going to release the three separate kits that that make it up. You know what I mean? It looks like Mm. it's three different kits. Yes, from what I've been told, it's a modular kit. Right, so I imagine it's probably going to be, you could easily, at the very least, have two different boxes you can purchase to make it. You know what I mean? Yep. Like the wall part and then like the circle part. Actually, I'm going to contact them right now and demand an answer! (laughs) So, I mean, that was cool. Another thing that I thought was really cool, but part of the whole, you know, cool yet useless <laughs> is the limited run from Forge World of the, um, I think, I don't know if it's over already or not, of that Knight Scion. Oh, he is around until the 30th. Right. I mean, he was cool, but it's just like, that's cool. Not, doesn't do anything, but cool. <laughs> Yep. It's he, a cool, nice little model. He comes with a, It's a nice incentive to purchase the knight here and now from Forge World. Mm-hmm. He looks yeah. cool. It's just like, I mean, I guess you could put him in your Imperial Guard as like a sergeant or something. I don't know. But aside from that, it's kind of like, cool model. No use, but cool model. Mm. But um, I was just... I, I have to say, I am surprised considering last week was the stealth suit big thing. Yeah, I was expecting the Tau Codex to be announced by now. To be honest, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> In- indeed. Oh, question here. Um, before we continue on with this, actually, I'll wait until afterwards. Um, so yes, I am a little shocked that the Tau Codex is still not out. Um, 
one thing that I have that we have posted on our um um on our little um on our Facebook page was that the um chaos codex is also gone for now off the website. Could this possibly mean that they will be after Tau? Thoughts? Maybe um it's weird and I say that because for example, when the Space Burn Codex was coming out, mm-hmm. obviously the Codex was gone. But yep. then they re- they got rid of the two supplement books from GW's website, and then they came yeah. back as eBooks later after like when the Codex was like announced. So yeah, it, 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 it's always a possibility that it'll be next. It could just be for some reason they took it down and they're gonna put it back. You know, it's mm. it's weird because I would say yes. But when you look at the case of Tau, they still have the small format Tau Codex for sale. <laughs> so yeah. you could say, oh, they took the Tau Codex down. Well, kind of, sure. But it's still there. And the obviously Farsight and Clive is still there too. But it's just I don't know what's GW's problem over the past, I would say, half year or so. But they take stuff down in a haphazard format, and they're not completionist about it, you know? Like, yeah. really, Tau are coming, I would assume, with a new codex. We have two new units. Nope, nope, nope. Same codex. And new... That's going to be the big announcement next week. <laughs> and, and new Fire Warrior stuff. So Guess what, folks? You know all that new stuff we've been giving you! <gasps> That's it. Yeah. But but, uh, but but what about a new codex? You got rules! Just buy the White Dwarf. But right. But... But that white dwarf is sold out, and it's out of print. Just find the white dwarf, and you got everything. You're good. Yeah, but it's just like, you know, obviously they, they took down the, the full-size talent yep. codex. Um, yep. You would think they would remove the small format, too. It's just they're not – they haven't been the best at, at sprucing things up and getting it ready. They never have been, and – I don't. It, it's it's a bit odd. I, I mean, it's just it could be a case of hey, Tau Empire small format. That's still a thing. Remember when we did that and then we stopped doing that for codices? Well, it's still there. But um, you know, maybe it is for people who just can't wait for the new Tau Codex to, to see what the Tau have. They can buy that. You know, it's a ploy to, to sell more stuff. Sure. Um, yeah. I'm not gonna get too jaded about it because I'm pretty jaded as a person. Period. But, you uh, are super jaded. It's just that I'm already, you know, I don't need to view another, you know, this hobby like the Sonic um, fandom is views Sonic games. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like, I've already, I'm already a part of that. I don't need that for another hobby. So I'm just gonna wait and see what happens. <laughs> you know, I'm not gonna mm-hmm. complain about good. I'm not gonna go. Yeah, the Fire Warrior kid, it's a new kid, but you know, it's not quite. When they gave him this, it's you know, it's cool. Yeah. End of story. <laughs> So, we've got some other interesting things that came out this weekend. Uh-huh. We had the Forge World Weekender. Yep. And a plethora of stuff. And I'm now reading off of some of my news info. We got more info coming out about things that are happening within this, things that are happening, things in the happening circles within circles. Stuff. Yeah, I mean... And with that, just before, I have a quick question. What does R-O-W stand for in Horror's Heresy? R-O-W? Yes. As people have mentioned, like, one of the things that someone who was there reporting on the um, the thingy, one of the things they mentioned is, as people have mentioned, all legions will have one new R-O-W. A, a Blood Angel, a Dark Angel, a White Scars, all having two R-O-W to make oh, up that's the, for um, their lack of rights of war. Okay, what's the rights of war? That's their chapter tactic thingies? Well, uh, That's that thing, you know, everyone with this special rule type of thing. That's what makes the different legions different, right? Well, not... Uh, it, they, they, they essentially have, ta- like, the equivalent of chapter tactics. Yeah, that's I, what a rights of war is. No, I think the rights of war is, like, if you're... You take this right of war, and now Terminators are troops or something like that. You know, ah. like, you know, like if, depending upon... You take a Praetor, it's yeah. a right of war, whatever. Yeah, you can give them rights of war to like change how they like. He leads the the killing squad of killingness, so destroyers mm. do this or something like that. Okay. The rights of war for this is like legion specific. This could be the Praetor, the Blood Angels gets this if you want it. Okay, it's 
Latest news that we are hearing is Book 6 is delayed, expected to come out in February, which is when apparently the next um, Horse Heresy Weekender will be. Um, there's going to be some changes too, like the Emperor's Children's, um, to, um, to fix some mistakes that were going on with missions and such. The Stormbird is still being worked on. It's huge, and it's turned into a nightmare. <laughs> the new Dark Mechanicum Nighthouse in Book 6, the color scheme is on par with the new night release on Friday and looks very pretty. May well have decals released in the future. Oh, new yeah. brass set for Night Lords and Iron Warriors. There have all been lots of information about the Leviathan Siege Dreadnought. Suffice to say, it's a Dreadnought with Quake autocannons and twin link Vulkite um, Cleavers. Yeah, col what? Col culvers. The, the, culvers. The, the guns what's that people say go chum, chum, chum. It's that, that gun that, that Space Marines no longer have. Uh, it's, okay. It's, uh, One Prime March is being sculpted, yeah. and another is in the demo process. No confirmation on which one. Yeah, I mean, this is all well and good, but the, the big yep. thing to take away from this is that um, Ooh. hurry up and wait is basically the motto. <laughs> yep. Ooh, there's something interesting that apparently was released it goes, it's about the Magnus model. Yeah, whatever. It says Magnus will be will not be larger than the other Primarchs so that he fits in the range easier. Simon is having a nightmare is having a nightmare thinking of how to sculpt with Magnus because his eye and horns on the armor. So apparently he's not going to be any bigger than the other Primarches. He'll look in the part. He'll be fine. It, it makes sense because it's like the same thing. He'll probably be as big as Vulcan. Vulcan isn't that big, but supposedly he's the largest of the models right now. He'll probably be there. He'll probably, I mean, he'll probably be overall a bit bigger. Mm. And but it's not going to be like OMG, he's the size of a knight. You know what I mean? It's not, yeah, it's, yeah. You don't have to worry about that. Yeah, no. I just find it, I was hoping that he'd be maybe like one step taller, but that's just me. <laughs> it, it really is a superfluous thing. It's yeah. just like because I mean, firstly, you have like Magnus is huge. You have the description of the lion is tall, one of the tallest, and it's like how are we are we really going to have to get down to the minutia of this guy's got to be taller than this guy, and this guy's got to yes. be the belt. The answer is no, of course. Yes, um, dang it, because I'm an entitled hobbyist who demands everything that I want see, to this, be perfect. This is why, this is why like. I said I I'm already part of the Sonic the Hedgehog fans. I don't need to do that to 40k and 30k. But the, I know it. Yeah, it's, it's you know what it is for me. It's one of these like it's all these all kind of all moments. But you know I'll live. Yeah, because people got to remember you're getting and a primer also, model. Relax. Yeah. And and also it will also on the flip side that means he's not going to be more money. Well, more than yeah, <laughs> like. More than any of the other Primarchs. Yeah, he'll be priced accordingly. Per put yes. you that way, but so the it's sad, but I'm not like the only bleh. thing that really needs to be said about what's going on is if don't drag out the legions getting what I call their core, mm. and what that is is book one, two, three, and five because four was four uh, <laughs> with um. The legions that were brought out new all got their legion special rules stuff, their legion specific war gear and other things, you know, that makes it so, oh, I feel like the legion now. And then on top of that, you got a couple of special characters, a couple of special units or vehicles that to be like the equivalent of get it, it would be the equivalent of, you know, having the Crusader squad for the Black Templars and the Space Marine Codex. You know, you get something like that for your Ultramarines or your Iron Warriors or whatever, and mm -hmm. a couple of special characters and your Primarch. Book two had some of the legion had the leaders from book one getting like an extra unit or so, and you're going to have the clever release of extra stuff for the legions already established to make those fans want to buy the book. Yeah, but one thing that has always been kind of weird in the rumors is how they're going to basically do the whole lights thing. You know, we're not going to we're going to release just the legion tactics and that's it, which. Mm. I'm hoping proves to be just a weird misinterpretation of what people are saying, because. Mm. A, it drags out longer for that one legion or two, whoever is in the book or all of them. And B, you now have a legion that is forced to get at the very mo at the very least two books. 
Mm. Because, yeah, word bearers are in book five with a couple extra dudes, but their entirety is in book five. So if you wanted to get that book instead of book, was it three or two it's in? Um, you could, yeah, but... I don't know what Jalal Ogar's in. <laughs> um, but, like, the Death Guard are in book one. All Like, what you need is extra units and other books, of course, that's Death Guard specific, just to make you want to purchase it if you're a Death Guard fan. But everything you need to get started with the core and be fine and all Death Guardy is in book one. So now you got... Let's say Blood Angels. You get the Legion Tactics, and then there's no guarantee the next book is just not. It's just going to be you know. It's going to have the rest. It might just be Primarchs, and then the book after that is the rest. You know, it, it, it's I'm, basically turning like it, it would basically be like if the if the Space Marine Codex was Ultramarines only, and then Sentinels of Terra was how you got all the Imperial Fist stuff. You know what I mean? What I'm thinking that this is going to be. Honestly, from what I'm seeing, I'm thinking we're going to get everything but the characters, and then the characters are going to appear in whatever campaign book that's more focused around the chapters. I don't know, so because the special so units thinking, are, are the equivalent of characters, but as units. I'm, look, I'm thinking yeah, it's just going to be... That's what I'm saying, is like we're going to get like the units that are specific to them. Which, and, is, cause, which is my whole and, problem. That's, that's what I have a problem with, because A, you have five... Well, Four, technically, I get it. But you have five books out, four of which have established a certain theme and release structure. Mm. And then you just to, – to just radically change it is just – it just seems a bit – it just seems odd. When I heard the first announcement, which is basically the same as it is now, it just seems odd. You know, It's kind of like you, you're changing it up. It's like writing a novel series and midway through it going, oh, plot changed completely from where it was. And it's like, wait a minute. <laughs> Well, we can't say for sure exactly what's going to happen as of yet. We but... have to see what book six will be. It's just that yeah. this turns it into very much the possibility for the Black Library. You know what I mean? <laughs> and really go, okay, we're at book 11 and White Scar still haven't shown up yet. What's going on? You know what I mean? <laughs> like that's what I don't – that's the only thing I don't want to have happen because let's be honest. The Horus Heresy went from being something that had literally a paragraph and that's it to exploding in fandom and popularity. <laughs> And it's like uh, you can still I, milk it, so I don't want them yeah. to go too crazy with that, only yeah. because there are rules. Yeah, I don't think they're going to. Um, to be honest, I think it'll be fairly substantial what we get, and I don't think that they're going to. I don't think they want to black library this well, because they could do so much more after the fact with it. They could, but I just look at it as book five sets up for the Shadow Crusade. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And the Shadow Crusade is still Ultramarines and Word Bearers. So, like, Book 5 is – not that Book 6 is going to be the Shadow Crusade at all, but Book 5 is like, all right, Shadow Crusade is ready to come at you. And it's just – ideally, it should be legions are all out. All the plot set up now can happen after the fact and not to piecemeal it. And mm -hmm. you, you never know. It's just that the, the reason why – Aside from costing less money to get the rules, you, you know, to, per to collect the rules, number one. Number two is we're talking game rules here. We're talking – like we're not just talking wouldn't it be cool if the White Scars got a story. We're talking about I wonder what the White Scars rules are. You know what I mean? And that's the issue. That's the only reason why – I mean this – where they came out in 2011, 2012 with the first book. So we're, we're approaching the five-year mark pretty soon, um, and – when you think about five years to get – I mean we're talking 18 different rules, so there's a lot to go on. Plus they gave us Mechanicum and other stuff, but – Yep, and the Solar Auxiliary. Yeah, yeah. The, the other stuff, but it's – you don't want them to – you don't – while you, yeah, you can understand it when you take a step back, at the same time we are looking at the story of the Legions, and we're, and we're still waiting for the Legions to have the rules to then go out. And cause once – you know, they're the core. Once you get that set up – when you think about the story, what the horse heresy is, which is their story, then yeah. Buck Wild with all the crazy cru Shadow Crusade and crazy knights that walk upside down on moons. Who knows? You know, just make stuff up at <laughs> that point. Crazy knights that walk upside down on moons. Yeah, they walk on their heads and their legs just kick around frantically. But uh, <laughs> that's how they move. Yeah. It's with the rocking of their legs, yes, kicking exactly. frantically. And then they could like throw in just random stuff for like a random squad of Xenos. You know, like. They could do something where it says, hey, random alien species that was brought to extinction by the the Horse Heresy and the Great Crusade. Here's a the couple. Squats. Yeah, just, yeah. <laughs> and now our whole – now, we, everyone, this will be the last podcast because I said the word. Yeah, the word. But um, 
It's like pushing the Goku button. You shouldn't have done that. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> but um, um, it's just you. There's so much you they could do, have fun with, go wild with in the in the Horus Heresy time period. Then you have the age of the the um the scouring after the fact, and then aren't they? Is it Forge World GW that announced, or maybe it was Black Library? I forget who, but there's this huge orc thing coming. That was a black library, Which so quickly it's most s- likely a novel. Yeah, but that's how the Horus Heresy started. So True. You know, we have that that could blossom and maybe give us more Imperial armor books that are not just, you know, recreation <laughs> updates, but like... You're su- you were the chosen one! <laughs> you were supposed to balance the orcs, not leave them in darkness! <laughs> <laughs> you were my brother, Forge World! I loved you! <laughs> But uh, it'll be so. You know, there's just so much coolness that is at, is out there. They can basically do whatever they want in the Horse Heresy time period, essentially, uh, mm. short of wake up a Necron Tomb World because that didn't happen. Yeah, but they could, and they just have it obliterated. Who knows? They could, again do whatever they want, but the structure should be there for the legions before you go buck wild. Like Book Four, in my opinion, shouldn't have happened. At least without a new legion in it, period, or until all the legions were done. Like that's, and you just you never know. And it's not because I want my thousand sons to be cool looking and whatnot. It's because, in general, every legion has a pretty good fan base. And the last thing you need yeah. is that one or two legions to go. Guys, we still need rules. It's been seven years, <laughs> you know. So that's the only. That's the always been the concern when this started, and. Anything that sounds like it's a way to prolong it sounds yeah. questionable until legions are out. But it's Forge World. Forge World hasn't really done people rotten, really. Yeah. So you never know. Yeah. Ooh, interesting thing I just found. Um, apparently, I just found um, someone posted the rules for the new Eldar Wraith Knights that are out. <laughs> well, and well, coming out. Yeah, they're not out yet. And whoa, 315 points, and just as I thought. That's interesting. Um, they, I, they don't have the rules for the um, the we have names for the um for the weapons. Uh huh. Um, either a let's see a t- death shroud cannon. Or an Inferno Lance. So I'm going to assume the Death Shroud Cannon is the giant, um, um, monofilament, um, web warp spider gun thingy that is on. And I'm going to assume the two Inferno Lances are what the look like the baby pulsars. No, it's the other way around. What's, <laughs> what they twist. But, uh... What they twist. And it's interesting, um... At least looking at this thing here, um, going onward to what this says here, it looks like it's a str- um, I can't tell what weapon this is because it's cut off completely, but one of them is seems to be like a light in light weapon it light weapon um light armor weapon with the monofilament rule and blast weaponry, and it looks like it has two things. And apparently it has something called a Webway Shunt Generator. Well, that's that's always good. Um, yes, who knows what it does. All I know is, is I'm probably going to have to get this because it's a Wraith Knight. Right, and, you know, always and, cool to get stuff like that. Yes, and you guys don't have a re- any... You don't have enough reasons to hate me and my Aldar yet. Well, nobody will because you can't roll with them. What do you mean I can't roll with them? What, I, you're, I, I, whenever I face your Eldar or... It's, been with Oh people. right, I always miss <laughs> yeah. it's, it's only against you. Against you, my Eldar can't hit the broadside of a bar. <laughs> that's my point. Like, I, like that's the only time like, I really Wraith Lord, I need a three or better to hit you. Two. Well wait, I casted fortune on him. Two. <laughs> Wonderful. Or I can't pen you. Three, I hit I need a two to gl- to pen you. I need a two to glance you. One. <laughs> Fair. Grr, wait, Doom one. <laughs> <laughs> That's how I was against that one Blood Angels game. I was I was playing against Blood Angels, and I was like, I hit, I have a twin link glass cannon to hit that rhino. 
I have a second film link last can and hit that rhino. I hit it. All I need to do is not roll a one. One. All right. Well, that was fun. <laughs> Though apparently I hear now, I have to look at it. I, apparently people are claiming that if your weapon equals the armor of a of a vehicle, it's an auto glance if it auto glances. That's weird. Well, mine didn't in that case anyway. But yeah, I, but I, that's here. I have to go over that. If people are list, if people have a rule book with them, double confirm that for me. Yes. Because that's what I heard was that supposedly now, like, say if it's a strength ten weapon and it's armor ten that you're hitting, you auto glance even if you don't roll a one. I'll have to even if you roll a one. I'll have to double check that later because that just seems like. Well, it seems weird. It won't. It wouldn't pop up too often because that's the only time you yeah. can do it. Is basically with armor ten, but. Yeah. It just seems a bit weird. Um, yes. But what's not weird is this community-made modification for Deus Ex. Oh, yes, that one where the guy's, like, giving us the revamp that we all want, but the company that owns the game won't give it to us. <laughs> yeah, basically, it's Deus Ex Revision, which is ba- uh, essentially a, a um, higher-quality first... build of the first Deus Ex. Yeah, it's not going to be Human Revolution type of graphics. Good, gonna, yeah, no. But it's going to be a lot better. I just have to. I have it. I just haven't installed it from Steam yet. I still need. I still need to finish the first game. You know, I've never finished that one. I every time I play it though, I get closer to the end. Right. Well, I don't have the first game um, installed yet, which means you, which you have to have installed in the same yeah. library to have revisions to play it. So yeah. you're not getting a game for free, which is why they can do this. But what you're getting yeah. is not a higher quality of the game and the possibility to have it run smoother for your computer, obviously, because yeah. it's more it's updated. So that was one of the big things I had a problem with with the original Deus Ex running it on my computer is that it would run, but it sometimes yeah. it would randomly crash or just freeze up and act weird because mm. the, it's like you're – I don't detect the stuff from 2000 because this is 15 years later and I don't understand what's going on. <laughs> Yeah, that's so. It's cool. That's cool. Like, it's not quite what we would, what I would ultimately like, but it's, it's gonna help. So, yeah. If you if you were having similar issues I was with the original Deus Ex, where it's just kind of like, hey, it doesn't quite run smooth enough because, well, 15 years later. Um, yeah. Yeah, which is completely understandable. Uh, <laughs> this is a this is a chance to be able to play through it relatively smoothly which was really cool to see and it's pretty new because it just came out october 13th Mm, you're gonna have to send me a link to that because i have it on steam and it would be cool to run it with a little bit nicer looking. yeah it's just on steam it's on steam store deus ex oh it's on steam store yeah deus ex revision on steam interesting that's even cooler yes and um and i have the game of the year of edition yeah which yeah so do I. That's the only edition they sell on on Steam. Yeah, <laughs> because it's not worth selling any of the other ones. And know what's funny? Yep. Nobody's making any references to Invisible War. <laughs> yep. Nobody yes. cares about Invisible War. Fan made mod for DS for Deus Ex Revision. There we go. Yep. <laughs> yep. But it's still nothing for Invisible War because forget that game. Yep. This mod is available to download for free today on Steam. Yay! Yay! Um. Also, I, I just finished playing a game on Steam, a, a decent amount, The Guild of Dungeoneering. Oh? The Guild of Dungeoneering is an interesting game. It, it's not a game that I would typically go out to play uh-huh. by looking at it because it's it's like a card-based game on the computer. But, card games on motorcycles? Yes. No, card. Not, oh. Card. But um, what it no, is is you card, play the Guild yeah, card. of yep. Dungeoneering. But instead uh-huh. of controlling the, the 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 adventurer, you build the dungeon around them. Uh-huh. They go certain places based on certain criteria. Like they'll visit unexplored tiles before going to a previously explored tile, and they'll go towards treasure or a certain monster at a certain level, and yada yada yada. And you build a dungeon around them to complete a certain goal. So you don't get to actually uh-huh. control them except for the battle. You get to control their actions in battle, but where they go, yeah. and everything is kind of depending on what you set up. So you can get them killed really easily, but which there really is no no uh no danger. Like it's not a game over if your dungeoneer dies and another one just shows up. Mm. Uh it's kind of like a parody game, but not it's fun it's fun and lighthearted, put it to you that way. And mm. um even with 
you know, uh, the expansion, Pirate's Cove, it's like a $22 game. Yeah. And granted, I, had, I made a second save file to play, but I, they're playing like almost like three quarters of the way through the first save file and then playing completely through the second save file because Pirate's Cove, I wanted to experience everything from the beginning. Yeah. Um, I have 51 hours invested in the game. For for twenty one dollars is really when you go dollar amount per hour. That's play, a lot. <laughs> that's a lot. So you get a really good investment, and it's a lot of fun. The, the it, it is a little bit rage inducing because it's purely you know random number generator for what cards you get to put down as tiles, and you need certain things, and certain things don't pop up, or it's just some and it just kills you that way. But because there's no mm-hmm. repercussions for dying, it's whatever. But it's it's fun, and if people enjoy that and want a lighthearted thing that has a pretty pretty cool bard style soundtrack of like yeah bardic music type stuff, it's really um it's it's worth downloading. It's on Steam yet again. It's 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 a fun little game, and it, it does a lot yeah. of parody type stuff a bit as well. Like um you have uh like the achievements. There's the cat burglar. And the achievement for winning a quest with a cat burglar is cat puns are awesome. And all the cat burglar does whenever he says something is a cat pun. <laughs> so it's it's really funny, and it's not it's all text based. But whatever he moves or does stuff, it's just that it's a uh, it's just all cat puns for the cat burglar. And the and like the ranger class in there makes references mm-hmm. to the ability to dual wield and like typical D and D other ranger stuff that it can't do in the game. But it's like man, if only I could do this, or can I do this? It's just really funny. So. If only I learned how to put two swords in my hands. Yeah, and like, and um, there's the combat system is pretty easy to understand, and it's got a tutorial level to basically teach you everything, which is really simple, and um, it's just fun. And I found it surprisingly fun because I was like, oh, I'll give it a shot because I was, I was like, why not? And it, I actually tried to really enjoy it. I thought I would have just wasted money, but I obviously didn't with 51 hours in the game, so. <laughs> Uh, mm. It's worth checking out if you're into that type of stuff. Yeah. So that's interesting. That's your Steam update of the of the month. <laughs> your Steam update of the month. But um, so also, StarCraft Two, Legacy of the Void. Oh man, almost here. And now, Whispers of Oblivion, the three prequel missions are on this are are free to play for anybody. Ooh, so I have to get on my Battle.net account yeah. after I remember what my Battle.net account is. Yes. I've been playing it a bunch. Like I, I, Since I pre-ordered Legacy of the Void, I had access to the beta, the beta for it, which is where Whispers yeah. of Oblivion was originally. But now it's Whisper, Whispers of Oblivion free release. Uh, you get to play it's three prologue missions, plus they changed the whole little the HUD for like you know playing single-player, multiplayer arcade games. And what's cool in campaign thing, they did a throwback to original StarCraft. Remember how you have like the the models you click for Terra and Protoss and Zerg campaign standing there? Yeah. That's how you can switch between the campaigns now. It's kind of like old school style. Interesting. So it's just a, a nice little like, you know, little tip of the hat, tip of the hat. Yeah. It's not a nice little update that they did. Mean. They did overall to their to their um, user interface and everything. Yeah. And um, plus, you get. Whispers of Oblivion, which which are fun three pre uh, prequel missions, and um, now do you actually hear someone whisper about Oblivion? Kind of, sorta. The game, you know, not 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 some Oblivion thing. Like, do they whisper? Have you played Elder Scrolls Oblivion? No, you know, they don't do that. Oh, then that's false advertisement. Well, they didn't say <laughs> it whispers Oblivion. Does it whisper Oblivion? I'm sure. Well, you know, in a metaphysical sense, sure. <laughs> But uh, if you if you do a, a, an Art Deco impersonistic impression of it, yeah, it whispers oblivion. <laughs> but, um, so there's that. Plus, if with Heroes of the Storm, if you pre-order the, the, like I think like the digital deluxe edition of the game or the collector's edition of the game, you get early mm-hmm. access to Artanis as a hero in Heroes of the Storm. It, uh-huh. Play Heroes of the Storm, which since I do Artanis, that should be pretty cool. But um, the one thing I will say. Like, have you seen that little video where Artanis is sitting on the moon and the dude's like, you must fight yeah, for yeah. us. I'm hoping that's not how the cutscenes look in the game. Oh, no, it's not. That's, that was just like a um, like a story setup. That's the only thing I was like, I hope this isn't a cutscene because I, that's just a step back. Yeah, I don't believe it is. In fact, when you once you download the patch 3.0, 
the uh-huh. the intro for Legacy of the Void plays when you start up StarCraft 2. Interesting. It's a really cool intro. I mean, it's on YouTube. Is it full of explosions? Um, yeah, in a manner of speaking. Is it full of explosions? Yeah. Let's see this. I'm going to see this Legacy of the Void. But, um... Yeah, it's 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 what is it? Once I turn my keyboard on because the cat was walking on it. It's November tenth, right? Something like that. Yeah, so it's, it's coming soon. Sooner than everyone expected. And I have to say, you know, I I, I like Protoss and Terran, but I've always kind of had an inkling towards Protoss because I was better at playing it multiplayer than I was Terran. <laughs> but uh, um, I always like Protoss, but I'd say that I probably my best army is zerg yeah i liked i wish i was better with terran because i really like terran ghosts and all that but the ter- I, ghost reporting let's just i'm like, gone put it to you this way um i just don't play multiplayer against people anymore in starcraft 2 because i just it's it's too it's too intense even though it's got a ladder system and all that jazz you, and you should pl- we should place um together because we're equally skilled <laughs> it I, would be pathetic on both ends <laughs> i just i'm so bad at doing it like that like it was not a campaign setup i can't play the game anymore is what i noticed but um mm. i would love a miniature game for starcraft 2 that would be interesting i think it would be awesome or i would love a starcraft 2 rpg like tabletop rpg Hmm, that too would be very interesting. I believe there was like a D and D, either for I, Starcraft or Diablo. There was like a spinoff, expa- like book using D and D rules to make yeah, to play a game, doing the open source yeah. stuff. And there was like something from the nineties with that, but um, yeah, I, I can't remember exactly. But um, you know what's crazy? I was what? looking at the other day, Super Mario sixty four is basically 20 years old yeah that's about that's crazy yep. that's yep. absurd it is ridiculous it's still an awesome game but that's absurd it is very interesting and actually speaking of nintendo some interesting news has come up that i've heard um dev kits for the nx have apparently gone out interesting and it has been described as a hybrid between a home console and a portable console. Uh, that's kind of been Nintendo's route. Yeah. Um, especially now with recent um, with recent um, patent releases, it seems like it could be the very much what they're going with is basically a handheld system that's powerful enough that you can connect it to your TV when you're at home, but then bring it on the road when you're on the go. Right. I mean, bottom line, I'm a Nintendo guy. I like Nintendo. Yep, I don't, they're my they're my fave. Like, of the three, I've always enjoyed Nintendo, and that's partially because yep. that's my first foray into gaming was Nintendo. was Mario and mm-hmm. um, Mario... Zelda, and yeah. Star Fox, and mostly Mario, <laughs> and then you yep. know until Super Nintendo, and then and then I had to take a Genesis, so I didn't get anything. But um, <laughs> but but playing at a buddy's house, you know, Super Mario World and all that. Like I like Nintendo and all mm-hmm. the bashing and stuff. I always have faith in them, and I always like. I don't currently. Ha- the only thing I have is a DS, Nintendo wise, really, that mm. I currently own because that's all I currently own. But I just <laughs> I just like Nintendo and. I, I don't want to see them go the route of Sega Team. I would like to always I would like for there to be a console Nintendo slash mobile system. device thing, a system for them. Um, yeah. Just because I don't know, there's something when I for me when I think about Nintendo and about gaming, it's like it's nostalgia, of course, from being a kid. But it's it's not this hardcore, you know, gaming is not for casual people. It's more of the the soft and fuzziness it'd be silly sounding but you know in like a, like the like sense, like the commercial we would like to play with you it's just like let's just yep. play and have fun <laughs> in in a sense um nintendo is that system where you don't need to be hardcore to play video games <laughs> and i mean i have playstations i don't you know i have the ps3 and and the ps4 and you fool I, and i'm very casual about it i got that because blu-ray player but uh, 
Yeah, <laughs> but it is the best Blu-ray player on the market. It's really it's silly when you think about it because I look at it, especially with the PS3, when that was a thing. Because for a very mm. similar price, you got something that was a way better Blu-ray player, 3D supported. Yeah. And you had games if you were bored. You know what I mean? It's kind of like there's no yeah. other reason. There's, like why even look at other Blu-ray players to be honest? But um, but I'm very much a casual player, which is why the whole like craziness of of the consoles and the next gen and this that. I'm like whatever. I'll buy a game every so often and play it every so often. But with yeah. Nintendo, it, I just I just feel like Nintendo's never really gotten away from the Nintendo's still gaming, not an entertainment device. Yeah, it's it's very much just a sit down and play a game system, and that's one of the things I like about them because I could always I could always sit down and enjoy a Nintendo game. Yeah. You can't always do that with other games. Like it's, like other games, I found are like a real even like games that are fun, like the Batman series and all that, the Arkham series. Yeah, it's an it, you have to it's an an investment. You have to sit down and commit. And yeah, Nintendo has games on their systems. I have always though were similar, but a lot of I, it just felt more of a just oh casual kind of pop in play a game. Some of my fondest t- uh, memories of playing games was on the GameCube, mm. and because the game because of the GameCube size, what me and uh, my buddies from high school and into college did for a, a lot of times was we all owned GameCubes. We all went to um, our one buddy's house with our portable TV, our small TVs. Mm. And the game, like the system and a TV, and we did, and we all had the attachments for for internet, which never did anything, but you know the thing to connect to a router with, and yeah. we basically LAN partied with GameCubes, and we could play against each other multiplayer on our own TVs. So we didn't have any split screen stuff, and we just mm. hung out for like a whole day, just gaming on GameCubes because you could do it like that, and hung out in the same room playing with each other, and that was so much fun. We did it throughout the summertime, multiple years, with the GameCube, and. And that was when you had, you know, the Xbox out and the PlayStation stuff, and even when the Wii came out and other stuff, we still did that with the GameCube. We all had GameCubes. We got, yeah. you know, the Mario Kart games, and then even when we weren't landing, we had different games set up on the GameCube, just playing and chatting and chilling out, and then switching off and playing somebody else's game on, on their cube and on my cube. We're playing WarioWare and stuff like that. It was a fun time. It, like, for me, Nintendo, I mean, it's, it's, it's internet set up. Obviously now, yeah. but I feel it was like, especially the GameCube was like truly the last one of the last straight up physical social interaction gaming system because you could mm. literally pick it up and bring it wherever you want because how tiny it was. Yeah, and people, I mean, people still go and hang out and play. Like I noticed, people when you go and hang out at people's uh, like houses or apartments or whatever it is or dorm rooms at the time um when it was a nintendo people hung out and played nintendo games when they had the, like the xbox 360 or the ps3 or whatever you you may hang out and there might be playing going on but it's not like a everybody it's like somebody's playing and you're just hanging out and chatting and then maybe somebody else will try it but it's never like oh let's all play you know even as silly as it is mario tennis or mario party or yeah. mario kart everybody who's hanging out hang out as long as there's enough um controllers and it wasn't too many people uh yeah. It was like, hey, let's hang out and we can play WarioWare, you know? And it's just like we all mm. – you were all hanging out to play the game and hang and have fun. Where right next to the GameCube was the Xbox 360, and it was just there. I was like, oh, look, that's a cool game. But yeah. we didn't play it as a, as a group. It was just something social and fun about Nintendo that I've always – I've always cherished no matter what people say mm. about it. Yep. No, I always enjoy them because I could always play their games regardless. I, you know – I could beat one of their games, but I have a higher chance of play- replaying a Nintendo game than I do some of the other games that um, I have oh, oh, from the other systems. Oh, of course. I mean, outside of StarCraft multiplayer games that I played, I would say pro- I wouldn't even bat an eyelash in saying one of the games I probably logged the most hours in was Super Mario 64, like ever, from oh. playing at a friend's oh, house. Me. Where we did literally all nighters on Super Mario 64. Even though yeah. we've beaten it like a dozen times, we still hung out and because di- Super Mario 64 was for me that one game. And I imagine if you're of the younger generation and didn't get to play it, you know, when it came out, mm-hmm. when it was the thing, it's probably you know a piece of crud to some people now. It's like, oh, look yeah. at the graphics and how like the, 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 the they're so blocky. Why is why is Mario's nose a square? But the controls are still pretty solid. 
Yeah. And and it had advanced AI that apparently they traveled through time and copied it off Call of Duty. Apparently. But uh <laughs> but uh, it's funny when like with stuff like that, like for example, Apple's like, We invented gravity. <laughs> it's just like Yeah. But uh Apple. Welcome to the brand new, never before seen pressing down on a screen for stuff to happen. Well, here's a perfect example. Ha- you know, haptic feedback, the, the buzzing of the controllers and whatnot. Yep. Apple had a, they can't, I don't think they can copyright it, so on their Apple Watch it's called taptic feedback. And it's, it, it's a bit bigger and bulkier and does it slightly a different way, but they had to have something that was their own, obviously. And you know something funny also? They have a new stylus coming out. <laughs> If if you guys go back a couple of years when when Jobs was alive and all that, um, rest in peace. He made fun of stylus as being pointless and stupid, and you shouldn't ne- bother with one. And now Apple has their own. Oh, yeah. So now you should because it's important. <laughs> exactly, basically. <laughs> but um, but you know, but Super Mario sixty four. I had so much fun with like that game. If I could pick any games that I, I would love to go back to and just play, it's most likely that game. Even though I'm more of like, even though I love Sonic Three and Knuckles, and I'm a Sonic guy and I like Sonic Advan- uh, Sonic Adventure and all that. There's something about Super- just they. It's not often a game just everything clicks, right? Mm. And with, for me personally, Super Mario 64 is just that game. You could beat it over and over and over and over again, and then you can just have fun, you know, either trying to exploit glitches if you're trying to be that speedrunner guy, or you can just have fun going. I know how to get all 120 stars. I'm gonna make a whole. I'm gonna delete one of my previous saves of 120 stars so I can replay and get all 120 stars. Yeah, I loved it. And part of my fun, I spent hours total just in in the bomb zone. Ah, uh, bombs because. Well, I think it was second, the second star, maybe. Or no, no, not the second star. Or after the second star, there's a Koopa that you can get on the shell. The yep. bomb zone, or the bomb world. And I remember getting on that shell and just riding it for like a half hour straight Whee! all around the zone. And just doing my best not to lose it. And that was like <laughs> the zone to do it in. It was, this was so much fun with Super Mario 64 that, you know, man, that was a fun game. It was so, so... – they, they did so well with it. So now, thinking about this, so Nintendo, the possibility that this new system is going to be a, it's a home console, but press a button, flip it around, and and boom, it's a it's a DS um, <laughs> system. Thoughts on that idea? Um, I think you know, I think since the GameCube, mm-hmm. Nintendo has been all about that base, about that base, no trouble. But uh, mm-hmm. it's been all or rebels, you know, rebels. And, no, but I think they've all. I think they definitely had a focus on mobile gaming. Mm. And I think you saw it with the GameCube of how tiny it was, and tiny discs. Uh, <laughs> yep, tiny, tiny discs. And then with the Wii, still again very small, a little bit more cumbersome to be mobile because of the motion sensing. Yep, and all of the wires oh the wires the wires right but it was tiny enough that in a, if you got it sorted out in a travel bag way you could do it and yep they in fact made a travel bag for it exactly and then you get to uh the wii u which is you could say kind of like the beta of making something truly really portable like that yeah and um it's a, a novel goal and what i think a logical idea because when you look at things like phones, for example, how advanced phones are now, it's kind of like a mini computer in your hand. Why not make a device that's like that for gaming? Yeah. But I don't know. I mean, technologically, I'm not sure how the, the, te- the technology at currently how it is because when you do that, you you are making um, you are making some concessions, right? You can't. You just can't be for a certain price point as powerful as for example let's just use playstation 4 because i don't own xbox one yes um well and to be fair um in that sense to keep things going you kind of need to 
be a little bit more powerful if you want what they were claiming they were hoping to get with the Wii U, which was third-party support. Exactly. If you want third-party support, you got to be basically a powerhouse. You got to be a you got to be a PlayStation or Xbox. Yeah, and let's be frank, let's you got to be a PS4 because it's the strongest one. <laughs> yeah, I'm calling it out. No, it's just when you shots fired. But who cares, right? Because I I don't get paid by either. Um, yep. But it's just you're going to make concessions now. Nintendo. To their credit, has always been the company to go. We're gonna try something different. People want different. We'll try different. And sometimes it works, and sometimes it doesn't. But they yeah. try different. They've always been trying different. And I have to. You ha- I think that needs to be an acknowledgement to that in Nintendo's behalf, because part of being around for as long as Nintendo has been around doing gaming stuff um, is you have to. You have to set yourself apart. You have to be different, and you mm. have to basically, you know, uh, not invent, but you have to progress. And yeah. I think the biggest pitfall of what they're going for is how powerful can you be when you want to do both. For example, I think instead of it being a Nintendo 3DS type setup in your hand. I think if they got, I think if it had no mobile gaming capability, and you had to buy a second thing like the PS Vita, for example, mm. but it had the raw power at a really convenient size for transportation and being portable. Like as as slim as the PS4 is, it's still pretty. Bi- I mean, it's not hard to transport it around, but it's one of those yeah. things where it's at the size where I don't really want to move it if I don't have to. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. It's not it's not Xbox size, <laughs> right? When, that, when the original Xbox came yeah. out, that thing was like the size of a truck. Yeah. But yep. But um, I think if they focus on just powerful, super powerful, super portable system that needs a TV or some handy dandy plug-in gadget to be a monitor, um, that might be better off just for getting the support because you now you don't have to worry about well we need a second screen and we need this that and the other thing. Hmm. I want the NX to do well. Mm. I, I just... When you do that, you're naturally having to make a sacrifice. And I just wonder if that's going to hurt them on third-party support status. Yes. Um, Nintendo lets, you know, will be uh, lets, you know, to be honest in all fronts, I don't think they'll ever get the third-party support that um, they that they want. But to if they ever want to get closer to that, they do need to focus on power over anything. And the, a portable system... Um, my, only, my only issue is, is just how powerful can you make it where it can do both, be a, a home console... And a um, portable system at the same time. No, I agree. I know. I, I mean, and I look at it I like think, this: you have, I think, tablets. Why yeah. worry about making a portable system? Yeah, I think if anything, they should do like what one person once described: um, a um, what they should have done is like what was once described once as being the possible. Um, possible next thing for the next system which is a um a system that um a system where it's a home console system but you have an ability to connect a portable system to it to play it on the home series make it like again do that Make that the next – because right now we have the ability to make a 3DS connect to a Wii U and be the controller. Yeah. The next logical step, I feel, would be something where you plant the portable yeah. system down. You can then play the game on the TV while it's charging the home devi- – while it's charging the portable system. That, I think, would be the next best thing. I, I got you. I think, I think, like, for example, right now, the uh, the – the the Vita mm-hmm. can connect to the PS4, and I think do stuff that way. And I think it you can, can connect to the PS4, but only if the game that if the game that you're connecting to it 
supports the connection, and there's only like two games that do. Right, but my point is, it can connect and be do stuff, and I think that I think what what Nintendo really should do is they got the idea of a mobile of a handheld device down, right? Yes. And they know how There's, to do that. They have proven you cannot dethrone them in the mobile gaming de- department. So I think they should ins- make a mobile gaming thing that can interface with their next-gen console to do kind of like what you were talking about and everything. And mm. maybe do other stuff. Maybe also be a controller and a pinch and stuff like that. Um, maybe Be a kid and a squid. Yeah. Maybe like basically do what the Vita does, but only since they're Nintendo, maybe make it do it better. Um, Because they know how to do the handheld thing pretty well. And I think what they can do is, I'm not saying they should get out of the handheld market. Yes, there's tablets. Yes, there's phone stuff. But that's for like tablet games and phone games. Not like Nintendo style games, which they can, which Mm. have proved to be really successful in a handheld form. Because, you know, Mario is super successful no matter where you put them, basically. But, um, yeah. But, I mean, when you look at I, you know, when you look at the, the next gen consoles or the, the current gen or whatever you want to call them that are out now, I think if Nintendo just took and um, went away from like the when I saw the Wii U, my first thought was, is this Dreamcast 2.0? Because the Dreamcast controller had a similar setup. Yes. And it's just like that would be like the that was to me would have been the progression that Dreamcast would have went eventually. I feel. Yeah, and I'm not nothing. I mean, I liked the Wii U well enough. It just it I didn't. It was a little bit odd when I saw that because I immediately thought Dreamcast, and then I remember Dreamcast tanked. I'm like, uh oh. So um, there was that. But I think if they went ahead and went, let's make the most powerful thing we can, you know, to you know, as small as we can, for a good price point. Like what? Like if it was coming out at the time the PS4 and the Xbox One were coming out, like let's mm. make something that can be on par with the power of those things, but at least half the size. Mm. So we get back to that GameCube style of let's go, let's bring this over and play type of deal. And because the big problem with you're right, I agree. I don't think they're going to get the third party support that they that you know idealistically they want, like what's out there right yeah. now for the P- PlayStation and Microsoft. Yeah. But part of the way to get third party support is to make it easy to go to your console. For example, it needs to be easy to develop on yeah. so that they don't have to sit there and go, oh, "I don't want to I don't want to a dumb down the game so it can run on the on the lesser specs and b I don't want to have to learn how to integrate a new controller system that the other two don't have." Exactly. I mean, you look at for example Sonic Unleashed. You had the Wii version, which was fun enjoyable, mm-hmm. not quite the graphical capability, and overall a little different, missing some stuff yep. to the Xbox 360 and all that. Yep. And that right there is not something any develop- every developer is going to want to do. So that's yeah. if you can make it where, for example, using Sonic Unleashed again, uh, the 360 version could have been on the Nintendo version, that's all you have to do is do that. You don't have yeah. to be the most powerful. As long as you're able to be easy enough to be scalable where you don't really have to do anything, any real change at all. Like, mm-hmm. for example, the Batman series, how some people said the Arkham Asylum ran better on one of the consoles versus the other because it was designed from one and then ported to the other. Yeah. And it wasn't that it necessarily looked worse, but they were just, like you said, controller and interface things. But yep. the look was pretty spot on. Cause... For the most part. Because, like, Sony had the same problem with the PS3. Their archetype was so different that that's why 360 had a few more exclusives that year because the game companies were like, well, we don't want to have to learn how to recode this thing so it will run on the PlayStation archetype. Yeah, there was... There was we don't want to do that. <laughs> yeah, there was that. It was, uh, we're, it, was, it was the intimidation factor of the PlayStation 3's power. And that's also why a lot of the multi-platform things were designed on the 360 first and then ported over. So the 360 had a lot of games that just kind of ran a bit smoother because that's what we yeah. designed for. Because they were like, well, if we designed it for the PS3, then we can't port it to the 360. So Yeah, so they that's what Nintendo needs to focus on is, I feel, is that making a system that can make it easier to port games without, like, again, issues is... 
You don't want them to go, we have this 4K game. Oh, oh, we have to downscale it to 720? That's way too much work, man. Right. I... Um, you don't want that kind of a situation. Um, but at the same time, you don't just want you just don't want to be a cookie cutter um, system. Right. I think. But I think if they really focus on making a powerful a controller, could be you know you have your standard like if they were able to have a, a mobile gaming thing that was also the controller. So you had your mobile gaming there and fun, but then it could be a controller for the console. You, that way, people that, yeah, that would be a bit better. Consumer wise, I feel that was the Wii U's weakest point. Was when you got a Wii U, you um, typically when you get a new game system, you power it on, you set the date, you set the time, you tell it if you want parental controls, and you connect to the internet. Boom, done. Simple. Um, and or if you build an avatar, if their game has yeah, an avatar, for it to dance around. You download the appropriate yeah. patch. And yeah. With Nintendo's Wii U, you actually had to go through a mini tutorial on how to use the gamepad. And the game that it came with was there not to really be entertainment, but to teach you how to use the gamepad. You don't want to have... You don't... Your game system should be simple. Power it on, it goes. It shouldn't be this, okay... It shouldn't be like a video game, which was the issue. It ran like a video game where it had to instruct you on how to use the system. Right. And that, I think, t um, put made people be like, yeah, I don't really want this. Whereas the Wii U was a little, okay, it was a little weird, but you didn't need really instructions. Point at remote and things happen, yeah. you know. Yeah, no, even with, I mean... And that's actually what Miyamoto said because he worked on the Wii U. He's like, yeah... I'm not doing the NX because I think one of the big problems with me on the on the hardware part was is I was approaching it like I would a game and not a hardware thing. <laughs> right, which is understandable. I mean, when you look yeah. at it, the Wii was groundbreaking with motion controls and stuff. And while not yeah. necessarily needing a tutorial type game for it, it still yeah. it, it required a whole new learning to play a console again. It required a whole. What I'm saying is, is like when you turned it on for the first time, you weren't you. You looked at it and went, "Okay, here's a remote. Okay, I have to point it." You know, you were yeah. able to figure that out. Right, but my With point the Wii is, you, you were like, "How do?" Right, but you went from tell me your secrets. You went from having to get accustomed to that to now needing a tutorial game they shouldn't do that with a cons you know like, i'm agreeing with you yeah. like the wii u was now even more complicated and yeah and it, i i mean let's be honest the, the the i think a console with a separate controller since that's how it started and that's how it's still most successful is what they got to do now they pioneered motion controls to be honest yep so no, they did so what we can what all they need to do is basically have a, like maybe if they want to have a, a portable gaming thing that can also be a controller for their next gen console, sure. Just don't have it rely on the specs of the portable game. Yeah, and then um, or the portable system. And then I'm just t I'm saying if they could make it where hey, I can put this in a you know not literally in a pocket, but if you could make it as small as possible without overheating issues and Basically, I'm looking at my comp, the, the PS4 right now, and if you could get it to a half to a third that size somehow, but still have the power, you know, do something crazy, like basically make it not much wider or a little bit wider than a than a disc. Yeah. And if you could do something where you could really chop that size at at the very least in half, mm. and maybe have it come, you know, how consoles come in a box, and then you you have the, the controller and the wire and everything. If they did that, cut it in half, and then sold it where in the box it came in a travel bag already. Yeah. Then I think that would put them back on the market. Even if a third party just people going, well, they're marketing it to be portable by giving me a travel bag set up to hold this already tiny console. Yeah. And I think, I mean, again, I'm looking back at the GameCube, not because it was a, a powerhouse, although the GameCube was designed with the idea of having 3D capability. But the mm -hmm. crystal they needed to do so was too expensive at the time, so none of the games got it. But it was designed to support 3D before the PS3 and everything. It just it was just too expensive yeah. technology at the time wise. But the GameCube, not because it was a powerhouse at the time, it did so well because it was so tiny, mm. and it had a handle. I mean, I mean, yep. you, you, and it had an actual handle on it. Yes, to move it around and. 
I think a game system half the size at the power level whenever the NX comes out. Whatever is going to be that power benchmark level for the consoles of that time period. Mm -hmm. Right there, half the size travel bag compatible with whatever mobile gaming device they have to be controller set up, I think you got yourself a winning combination. Yeah. Um, actually, it's something interesting was just reported on the NX as we were talking about it. Uh, him not joking, this literally just popped up like <laughs> two minutes ago. Um, several people who have said several people who said who have seen a demo, this is like translated from Japanese, yeah. I um, from what I've seen, so that's Forgive the poor English. Yeah. Um, several people who said who have seen a demo said what they saw is impossible to run on a computer without a industry leading or cutting edge chips. Cutting edge in what way? They refuse to elaborate. And and an important thing to remember, probably you know well already, is that chip specs won't be finalized until much closer date to the release. So as of right now. They're saying the dev kits need really high specs in order to run, but we have seen in the past where dev kits were more powerful than the final product. We have, and you know, I gotta be honest, I don't know what to expect the console to look like. I've seen some like the NX, what it's thought to look like, and some pictures and whatnot. Mm. Oh, those like imaginings that people have. Yeah, like and it's like a box with like a controller on it and whatnot. Yeah, like it's smaller and. Uh, those, uh, who knows what it's actually going to look like it, until we see an official picture. And surprisingly, from what I have, um, what was it? What I also have read, they have an interesting patent that they signed up for, where it's one of two systems: one that either is pure digital, where you download all of your games onto it, and then you can make copies of those games on SD cards to bring them to another system. And a disc-only system where there's no hard drive, it's all disc-based. Huh. Which would be interesting. I would think it would be better if they did, like, a hybrid of the two, like there are now. Oh, yeah, yeah, and I I agree with that. But, like, I see, like, predicted renderings of what the game console will look like and everything, and Mm. we won't know... Until we get that first glimpse. 2016 is when we'll get our first word. Right. But – so whatever it turns out to be, I just think you, when you look at uh, – in terms of size limitations, number one, and then if you're limiting yourself to let's say a 12 by – a 12 by 12, let's just say, box, yeah. and that's your size limit, if you throw in things like a screen, controller buttons – and the the associated hardware slash circuitry to run that, you are limiting the overall size for cooling and power powerful you know processing and all that because you know you got to fit the stuff for the screen you got to fit yep. stuff for the controller which is why you know yeah you could make something small and do that people are making that all the time with with the whole Raspberry Pi stuff and everything um, mm. where you get to make your own little handheld portable game system it's not that powerful so yeah. That's why I'm saying if they, you know, make the controller completely separate, like we we're talking about and everything, yeah. it's just it's, I'm not worried about Nintendo floundering because you can't. No. It, every time, I'll put it this way, every time people I've heard count Nintendo out, they, it's not that they hit a home run. It's just that but they they pull, they pull themselves out of whatever rut yeah, they're in. They were able to be pulled out of whatever rut people thought they were in, and what they yep. did turned out to be a lot of fun. And let's be honest, Pokemon Go is coming out. They're going to have a lot of money to burn in a little bit. <laughs> right. Like, I I just think, heck, if they're able to make – if they can – what would be really cool, to be honest, is um, – do we know – now, NX, the NX, we have our first, like, announcement of stuff in 2016. Do we know when – do we have any rumor reports of when they want to release it? Um, No rumored report of release, but going off of – Going off of past experiences, um, we're looking at a 2017 release because usually they do 2000 the year before they make the announcement of this is what you're getting and then it comes out the following year usually. You know, it'd be pretty cool if they did. It wouldn't quite line up year wise for a 30th uh, anniversary thing of the of the Nintendo Entertainment System, but if it came out the size and relative shape of the original Nintendo. Hmm. 
That would be neat. But instead of where the cartridge goes, where the, where the disc goes and everything. Yeah. Which, apparently, funny enough, the reason they did a re- they redesigned it for the U.S. Was, and packaged it with the Wii Zapper was because they figured it would sell better because they figured Americans like guns. <laughs> <laughs> right. And looking at it, we are sadly out of time. Yes. So we are going to have to lead it off from here. Thank you all for listening, as always. Um, if you haven't yet, check us out on Facebook and on our our webpage at fearlessgames.com for more blogs, interviews, and fun stuff. And let us know, what was your favorite thing about the um, Forge World weekend that happened this week? Um, is there anything you're looking forward to? Things you wish that they announced that they didn't? Your favorite thing that they announced? And what's your thoughts on the new Nintendo system that, with these recent news information that we've gotten? Yeah, and, and just past that, what game do you can you look back on like we were talking about with Super Mario 64 where you can just pick it, like, you know, nothing but awesomeness is what you remember of it and you've played it and you enjoyed it and you can play it again in a heartbeat. You know. Yep. What is your Super Mario 64, basically? <laughs> and with that, thank you all for listening. And until next time, fearless gamers, this is Matt Levette. James Wildcard. Saying take care.